Hello and welcome to the third and final of the sub pools where we pick our last two contestants for the champion pool. Uh, as with all the other pools, the top two participants will be joining us in the champion pool. But let's get this uh, let's get the show rolling. Up first, we have Song Jang by or Song Jang versus Icemorn. I'm not even going to begin to try and pronounce this fleet name, but the Song Jang ships. This is a very similar looking ship we've seen out of Song Jang before. These these things served rather well, and you can see a little bit of a liberal use of hyper stacking. Uh, we've got. This thing, which has some torpedoes on angles, which might play in pretty well, depending on how much the ship fidgets. Uh, we've got torpedo arcs that look very vaguely reminiscent of something that we saw splinters do. Uh, not sure if that was inspiration or, you know, convergent evolution. And then we've got the... This thing has mostly manipulators, and it looks like only a couple defense cannons and flak. I think it's mostly just there to be a a damage sponge and distraction in here and I'm sure Flypaste will love this stacking job and let's see what else we've got and then we've got Icemorn, his fleet is a homogenous fleet a bunch of antimatter kiters with a little bit of missiles and no actual stacking involved here so we'll see how this holds up the, uh, the missiles, you can actually place the launcher there and then the missile will grow in the spot it's, it's not actually a stacking trick but Let's see how it goes. And somebody's asking about who made Holorser. Holorser is the person. He, I guess his parents, then, is the answer to your question. Shit talking is an important part of any sort of multiplayer experience. So I'm, I'm glad you're here to really round it out, Steve. I appreciate it. But you can see the antimatter kiters for Icemore and holding up very well early on. They're kind of starting to get pinched up against the wall, though, and that could be a very big problem for them. Because they really only rely on the shields and running around to survive, if they get pinched up on walls, then they're going to fall apart very quickly. Which, I'm... Smart Money would say that that's probably not what Icemorn wants to happen. <laughs> Glue Orser. The uh, yeah, the missiles for Icemorn's fleet actually do serve a pretty decent little tactical purpose. They ensure that damage is applied between rounds of the antimatter, which is very important for stopping armored ships from regenerating. But as long as a bunch of ships are alive, I don't, I don't think there will be enough time to trigger regeneration anyway. But you can see this kind of pocket over here for Icemorn ships. This is not ideal for Icemorn. The uh, being surrounded like that is a good way to lose a lot of ships very quickly if it actually comes down to it. But that said, they are much faster than Song Jang's offerings, which is going to give them a lot of options when it comes to where to go and when to be there. And round one goes to Icemorn. In a pretty good showing, but a couple of hairy moments. They they didn't quite go as awry as they could have, but there were definitely some hairy moments for Icemorn's fleet. And this round is starting off very poorly for Icemorn, with several of his ships deciding that knife fights are the appropriate range to use an antimatter cannon, which uh, 
I would disagree with. I think I think they're a little bit more effective at longer ranges, relatively speaking. Hey Husk, you are uh, just in time to see your f your sub pool, and also good night, fly pace. Yeah, round two going much better for Song Jang. This is a tough break for Ice Morton. He's got a lot of points he's got to score to cover that gap. Although that said, as soon as he gets through all the outer layers of armor, you can see he's scoring a lot of points very quickly. So either way... Have a good night, Floof. Appreciate you joining us. The green color that Icemorn chose for his fleet actually looks rather nice too in the uh, in the graphics overhaul. The projectiles are very easily distinguishable. You can tell what's a missile, what's an antimatter. And it looks like you're vomiting some sort of corrosive sludge at the enemy. Which is always fun. But Icemorn has clawed back and taken a point lead. And with the ships having a good bit of space to maneuver at the moment, I think we're going to see round two also go in favor of Icemorn. Very solid showing out the gate, but Song Jang is not to be counted out just yet. There are plenty of fleets in this pool, and most of them are pretty heavyweight, where those torpedoes are going to be a lot more effective. And Icemorn takes round two, and the match. So up next we have Song Jang up against SNW35. SNW35 is on some some weird shit in this one. We've got this here is yeah I think this is a three or no this is a yeah this is a three cannon tinkerel this long stick here. Not exactly sure how well that's gonna work out, but we'll see. And these are rounded tankrel gunships, also with three cannons, which might work out, might not. Uh, three cannons is a bit unusual, but SNW35 is... I'm sure he knows what he's doing. He's probably got a plan here. These little guys are dual, gan dual gun tankrel. I don't think these are going to be too useful, but I think they were mostly there just to fill in some points. Um, let's see. And then he's got tankrel laser sticks. We see these all the time. They're, they're just there to be diversions. But let's see how his fleets hold up. And yeah, we've got a lot more tank roll in this tournament than we normally do. You can see the recoil from the three gun tank rolls are pretty incredible. SNW 35's fleet's doing a pretty good job keeping uh, uptime on target and punching through all this heavy armor. Heavy armor can be a bit of a problem with multi gun tank roll, especially because they don't have any splash weapons at all. In the entire faction there are zero splash weapons for tank roll. Or well, I guess there's rocket drones if those count, but they're not very good. But the uh, the main cannon for tank rolls never have splash damage, so they have to punch through every single block of armor instead of doing it in chunks like torpedoes and sentinel guns. But that said, the uh, SNW-35's fleet certainly does have the punching power. And a massive score lead. Even with all the 
the little distractors dead. They, uh, as you can see, they didn't really add up to any points worth noting. All of his value is in the big three gun ships. So unless Song Jang can get close enough to actually deal with them, he's not going to be able to make any progress. And you can see the the impact from all of the three cannon Tinkrel ships is actually changing the speed and direction of Song Jang's ships. Like this thing right here was just charging very hard and now it's getting knocked away. <laughs> Let's see if we can find another good example. Tinkerel fleets are about the only ones that can actually have that effect as well. It actually almost looks like his cannons have different ranges. Although it may just be that they're very close together. No, because he's only firing one of the cannons. Yeah, one of the can the central cannon on those sticks is actually longer range than the exterior cannons. So at long range it only fires the one gun. And at close range it fires all three, which recoils the ship out of the bad spot provided it can look at the enemy and also dramatically punishes anything that happens to be in front of the muzzle and I'd be pretty surprised if these circular ones didn't use basically the same strategy yeah they do That is, that is a neat idea I hadn't really considered. The uh, the big problem with multi-gun tank roll is that they recoil so hard their uptime on target is atrocious. But mono-gun tank roll often have a hard time disengaging rapidly closing targets, especially things that are using proton swords and quantum doom beams are a very big problem for mono-gun tank roll because they just charge too hard. But it looks like SMW35 found sort of the best of both worlds in having different ranges on his ships. So at long range, it's a mono gun tank roll with good uptime, and at close range, it's a multi gun tank roll with heaping gobs of recoil. Really well designed ships. I really appreciate the uh, the quality of our tank roll submissions this tournament. We haven't really seen tank roll out in force and quite a long time. Yeah, the, this last pool is something of a nightmare pool, as the last pool tends to be. And SNW35 takes round one. So next up we have Song Jang up against Husk. Husk is opting for a heavily spinner focused sentinel build. Uh, you can see these purple spikes here are actually the melee spikes taking full use of the, uh, the fact that he's allowed to have 12 of the things on these little guys. Uh, these big guys are only using a handful of melee spikes. He's actually like missing one here and it kind of drives me nuts. 
because you can see he's got one on the edge of all the other platforms, but not on that one. But we've also got these rammers. It doesn't really look like it, but the front of these is all melee spike. So uh, let's see how this pans out. I feel like he's going to struggle a bit with Song Jiang's fleet, though, because of the sheer number of torpedoes. But that said, the rammer just tore apart one of Song Jiang's ships, so I guess Mon said no shit. And there, the power of melee spikes, does they just kind of accidentally the entire armor of the one of Song Jiang's ships. Melee spikes, uh, I try to mention at least once per uh, tournament. They seem to work based on kinetic energy and surface area. So having a rotating ship like this with melee spikes on it, even though it's slowly rotating, because the ship has a lot of mass, it ends up carrying a lot of kinetic energy. And so when its melee spikes do collide with things, they will continue orbiting right through it. Whereas light melee ships that are really light have to have a lot of thrust in order to actually dig through an enemy. Otherwise they kind of destroy a couple of blocks and then bounce off. Look at some of these cannons go off. And that is the danger in hyper stacking. Even though he's able to put out a lot of armor in most directions, once any of the internals starts to become compromised, the whole ship is just dead. Yeah, uh, weaponized eggplants, I suppose, is a pretty fair description. <laughs> anybody got an eggplant emote in chat? I think that's pretty important. There haven't been enough phallic references in the stream yet. There we go. There's some eggplants. All is well. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Alright. But round one certainly looks like it's going to go in favor of Husk. And given the fact that both these fleets are pretty brawly in nature, I'd be surprised if round two didn't go about the same. You can see the torpedoes did do a good chunk of damage to several of these ships. But uh, the staying power of Sentinels is always pretty impressive. Even if you expect it, they still end up pretty impressive. Yeah, uh, I'm not actually using Twitch. I'm using... Twitch web pages are pretty memory intensive and pretty CPU intensive, so I'm actually using an application to connect to chat, so it's probably slightly different emotes. At the very least, it's rendered at different sizes. Uh, I probably also have some emotes that don't exist in Twitch that are just here because of the application. Ring around the space boat. But yeah, I think we can all agree Husk has won round one. Just gotta let this guy see if he's a superhero or not. And now the cannons got a hold of it. I don't think that ship is long for this world. And there it is. 
Round one to husk. And here we can see, much like the previous round, it's just devolving into a slugging match. And even with all of the torpedoes that Song Jang is bringing, you can see two of his more heavily torpedo armed ships are trying to shoot a rammer, and it's not really going so well for them. And the rammer's having a hard time connecting too, but that's the nature of forward only thrust. The, uh, the brawl over here, however, Sentinel is predictably doing very well. There's just wreckage everywhere, but it's not Husk's color. Sentinels are... I will probably forever believe that Sentinels are the apex to your brawl faction. They're just too durable. Their guns are really good. Splash weapons on everything. Yeah, Splinter, you... I've looked at your ships, something tells me you're going to do alright. And this is the kind of thing you expect to find on Pornhub. It's sort of filthy gangbang. Reassembly tournaments, now sponsored by random illicit content sites. Right, Crystal is really good at brawling too. They, they've got the armor, they've got the damage output, but I think... Overall, I think the Sentinel Cannons are a better source of splash damage than crystal missiles and in brawling fights splash damage is super important and so I'd, I'd give the advantage to uh, the sentinels over the crystals hot two on one annihilator action while a third annihilator watches and you can see it just kind of like cutting through the wreckage. And that's what melee spikes do to things. That's why people hate them. But now we have Jeldar Escort by Jocrates. Another Tinkrel submission. Uh, this guy has a laser and so barely skirts by the need to have a weapon rule. And this guy's got some drones. This guy's got a giant pile of generators for a gun. I honestly don't think this ship can use all of those generators. I think it has more generators than it can use. Uh, I think that's the only three designs he's got, though. But we'll see how they go. A lot more drones than we've been seeing out of the other Tinkle submissions. I don't know if the other ones really had any drones to speak of. And again, with the corrosive green color. Jocrates' muzzle velocity seems to be a bit lower than the others, but that might be why he has the drones. I, I seem to recall he was talking about trying to get them to behave a little better. Uh, I was mentioning before that there are some tricks you can do with Tinkerel to get them to behave. 
And I think they try to calculate where they want to stand based on the muzzle velocity of the cannon versus its range and the target's speed. But the... Uh, but if your muzzle velocity is too low or your targets are too fast, your ship will end up closing range quite a bit instead of staying at the ranges where you designed them to stay. And effectively that just compromises the health of your tankrel ships and compromises their efficacy. But one of the things you can do is give them a drone launcher, like this little drone launcher on the back of Jocrates' ships. And you do that, and they always revert to kite mode, so long as they've got that drone launcher. And I don't even think the drone launcher has to be alive, I think it just has to be in the blueprint. But uh, some factions do have things like that that completely change a ship's behavior immediately. Uh, I don't have a comprehensive list, the drone launcher for Tankrel is the only one that comes to mind, and that always forces a ship to kite. But at the same time, you kind of have to be aware of that. Uh, I've had ships where they didn't have enough range, so I put a drone launcher on them and they just sat outside their own range. So a lot of testing is still necessary to make sure that the ship functions. But you can see that Jocrates' ships are doing exactly that, functioning rather well, putting up a lot of points. Yeah, and... The other way to control tinkerel behavior is apparently to be Duke Slayer and just share whatever arcane magic he's got that makes his non-drone launcher tinkerel ships behave. Non-drone launcher monogun tinkerel ships. I would never have guessed that they would have kept range until I'd seen it. And that was kind of one of the things I was getting on about with Duke Slayer's fleet earlier, about how they were well behaved. And that's because without a drone launcher, his ships were doing basically the same things we're seeing out of Jocrates' ships, where they're keeping distance, they're maneuvering. Uh, most Tinkrel ships, you'll end up with them getting way too close to the enemy and getting themselves murdered. But... Uh, Back to the matter at hand, we saw Jocrates won round one pretty comfortably, so I'd be pretty surprised if round two didn't go very similar. Song Jang's fleet having a very difficult time this tournament, despite looking and acting like many of the successful fleets in the past, he, uh, this pool is not being kind. And yeah, that, that's a pretty good point, Splinter. Song Jang is the only person using a conventional fleet in a pool full of people doing weird shit. And, uh... A lot of times conventional fleets got where they are because they succeeded, but I think we've all seen enough of them now that at least some testing was done against standard sort of fleet designs. And Jocrates' ships are much more expensive than Duke's or uh, S&W 35's, I'm just guessing by the ship count. So this little pocket here is bad. There used to be a third ship in there, but he managed to weasel his way out. And this is a, a tankrel problem. He recoiled himself into the enemy. Managed to get away, fortunately, for Jocrates, but uh, recoiling yourself into the enemy is ill-advised.
and Jocrates takes the match. So up next we have Splinter, uh, Purgatory Squad by Splinter up against Song Jang. So this is Ralph. Ralph has a bunch of tiny plasma condensers. Um, shit, I forget this thing's name. But we see flowers of antimatter missile launchers, which uh, I'm sure that won't cause problems for anybody. And then we've got this thing, which has some of the tiny plasma condensers, some of the big plasma condensers. These are nasty weapons. And some more of the missile flowers. So, uh, the medium one. Okay, yeah, so this guy's name is Chester. This is Ralph. And this is Chester. And I think this one's Delta, is his name. But, let's, let's get this show on the road. One of the really nice things about the crystalline missiles is that they don't consume any capacitor or generator to fire. They are, they have a point cost, but it, they fire for free, which makes them a lot more efficient than they would otherwise seem. It also means that if your only armament is missiles, you don't have to have generators on your ship at all which is pretty convenient sometimes if you're building around that idea because generators can sometimes be something of a liability if if you don't place your generators correctly or if your ship is too small to place your generators correctly uh, a single generator rupture will generally detonate the entire ship but if you don't have generators that's just not a problem Which, of course, Delta and Ralph have generators, because they have the plasma cannons, or the plasma condensers, which do use capacitor. But Chester doesn't need them, because Chester only has missiles. And we can see a, a pretty strong start from uh, Splinter. He, he was initially at a small disadvantage for the score, until those plasma condensers started firing, and then everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Delta and Chester here working together pretty effectively. This is a rather nice design from Splinter as well. The Waffle Lattice is very resistant to splash damage. Uh, he's using some of the larger pieces of crystalline armor, which has really high health density. And, uh,. Well, the, the health density isn't that great, but they're so large that they offer just a lot of health in general. Uh, they've also got the some of the most efficient thrusters in the game, especially since the Terran Asteroid Thruster is banned. The, uh, the Crystalline Large Thruster becomes the most efficient thruster in the game in terms of thrust per P and the amount of armor that they can move with any arbitrary point value which means that Crystalline can now be the biggest faction, basically, or like have the highest damage output relative to cost at a fixed speed. And no, that's a good point. Splinter didn't write his name in his ships. All right, five points off from House Gryffindor. But it does appear that round one is going to be going in flavor of Splinter. Uh, another thing about the crystalline missiles is that you can tell just looking at them, even with the time dilation, if you account for that, you can see that the crystalline missiles are very slow moving. But they have a colossal lifetime. So much so that they'll fire all the way across the map, basically. Like this guy, this Chester, was shooting at the fight. But uh, moving into round two, we can see all the Ralphs doing what one might expect a Ralph to do. But Delta getting in there with the guns early on. You can see the, the point lead I was talking about that Song Jang was able to build up early. It looks like he's able to do it again. The Ralphs aren't really pulling their weight so much, but Delta and Chester kind of have his back.
And I don't think there'd be enough budget to drop all the Ralphs and take another Chester or anything like that. These, these big guys are pretty expensive. You gotta love this. Rather than shooting through the wreckage, which would only take a few seconds, they just stop shooting entirely with the plasma condensers. Another tiny little flaw to be aware of in the AI. This Chester, though, I think might not be long for the world. He is in a bad way, in the wrong part of town, as it were. But Delta's doing work, the other Chester's doing work, and Splinter's built up a pretty sizable point lead now, so I think he can afford to lose that Chester if need be. Either that or that Chester's just going to kill everything. Who knows? Who knows? And yeah, I'm, my apologies to Song Chang. I'm not even going to try and read that fleet name. I uh, would not even know where to begin. Half the words don't even have vowels to speak of. But you can see what I mean by the range on the uh, crystalline missiles. Delta down here is providing fire support for Chester up top now. Some much needed fire support at that. And the missile tracking, you can see, tries to avoid wreckage most of the time. Oh yeah, now that that ship is gone, Chester and Delta would both be providing some missile support. Although I'm sure Splinter would like it if Delta would turn around and actually get in there. Yeah, I suppose that's as good a pronunciation as any. I don't, I don't really know. Unfortunately, Song Chang is not with us to uh, clarify the, the pronunciation. For all I know, it's abbreviations for something. Well, it looked like Delta May... With that other ship that came through... Delta kind of turned. He may have unfucked himself. Nope, he's still being dumb. Floating around like an idiot when he should be engaging. But I think the, the point discrepancy is insurmountable now. With that Chester holding on long enough. Yeah, he's in Discord, but unfortunately I don't think he's here with us in chat. And, uh... I didn't think to ask in Discord, I just kind of staged it and called it a day. It's just like, that's weird. Now we see some missile fire support coming in. No, no, Chester, you can do it. And Chester lived. Well done by Splinter, taking round uh, two and the match. So now we have Icemorn up against SW 35 Now, Icemorn's fleet is a ranged Terran fleet up against a ranged Tinkerel fleet, which I'm willing to bet is going to go in favor of the ranged Tinkerel fleet, because... Uh, Tinker will only do one thing well in its range. But they do it very well. Similarly, I think Icemorn's also going to struggle with Jocrates' fleet for basically the same reason.
Oh, is that uh, Song Chang's lead's name? And SNW35 takes round one. Much as anticipated. And uh, again, I'd be very surprised if round two went a whole lot different. Yeah, um, SNW35, I believe, is using drones to help manage his ship's behavior. Yeah, you can see him kind of shutting out a drone here and there. It only takes one drone launcher to do it, so you don't need many. But SNW35 uh, wins the match. A very dominant showing. Now we have Icemorn up against Husk. Here I think Icemorn might do a little better, but I don't know if he's going to have the damage output to really kill those big things. And with the Rammers throwing their, uh, their spikes around the field, that could be something of a problem for Icemorn's fleet. Uh, when, a melee s or when a ship carrying melee spikes dies, the melee spikes are still live weapons. Anything that runs into them, including what used to be friendly, will take full melee damage from them. Meaning that either side would take the damage, but Icemorn's ships can't have melee spikes because they're Terran. Meanwhile, Husk has melee spikes on all of his ships. So his chance of running into a melee spike and having it tear through a corner of his ship is dramatically reduced. But Icemorn is putting up some decent points on the board. It will take him quite a while to cut through all of that armor, though. Husk's fleet does have an abundance of health to work with. You can also see, I believe he's using... Yeah, he's also using the waffle pattern to an extent. Which means that even though Icemorn's using splash damage, as you can see there, it's barely getting anywhere and it's only hitting a few blocks as opposed to doing a ton of damage. These guys are a little less waffled, but they're also smaller and faster, so it's kind of okay. I do think this is going to go in favor of Icemorn. Which is unfortunate, we have Husk in chat with us, so I'd, I'd re much rather root for Husk, but I don't think his fleet has the mobility to deal with these kiters. And in the meantime, those antimatters will score points, and given long enough, they'll actually get kills and everything, but I don't think we're going to see too many more kills in this matchup. I think we, uh, we've seen about all we're going to. The rest is just going to be a point farm. The only real variability is whether or not some of Icemorn's ships get pinched on a wall. No, I was drinking. You were right, though. I did mute it. Ha 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 ha. My master plan worked. Now you're sneezing. But the... Yeah, as predicted. They're just going to kind of run around and shoot each other a little bit. 
but uh, I fully expect the second round will go roughly the same. Sentinel's ability to project damage at range is very limited, which gives the all of the kiter sorts of ships a pretty big advantage. Their biggest problem is actually dealing enough damage to kill the damn things, which is an entirely different matter. However, I do fear that that means Husk will struggle quite a bit when he gets to those Tinkrel submissions. The, uh, as we saw, both Jocrates and SW-35's Tinkrel fleets behave themselves rather well. But uh, both of them bring a lot more long-range damage to the field than antimatters can. But Ice more takes round one. And moving into round two. As you can see, the, the tiny size of the rammers is going to pose a bit of a problem for their longevity. A single hit from these antimatters, you can see, is just shattering the entire rammer. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not looking at Discord right now. Did someone ask Song Jang what his sleep name means? Did he translate it for us? like the wrong dialect we need answers Duke we need answers so now we got all these questions alright right, right. If Song Jang didn't upload a fleet, that's going to dramatically complicate things because I got a fleet from Song Jang. Let me check real quick. Uh, yeah, he sent it on May 27th. Uh, I'm looking at the email right now where he describes himself as Song Jang. So... I have no idea. I mean, in theory, anyone can make a ship that looks like something anyone else would do. Hell, I could just take previous submissions from people and kind of cobble them together with a couple different parts and call it theirs, and I bet it would fool most people. Let me check and see. 
previous tournaments to make sure I didn't Yeah, it's the same guy that's been submitting under the name Song Jang. So, something somewhere is crossed. Uh, I don't even know. But I'm feeling like I've done my diligence. Song Jang isn't Song Jang, it's been an imposter the whole time. <laughs> And Icemorn takes the match. So, up next we have Icemorn up against Jocrates. And much like we saw with SNW35, I think Jocrates has a colossal advantage in this engagement. And I think we're going to see it go in favor of Jocrates. He has fewer ships and fewer cannons than SNW35, so it'll probably take longer. But the advantage is certainly there. Alright, so, would that make it better or worse if all of the submissions that you guys didn't, if all of the submissions that weren't yours were actually me? Like, all of the people in Twitch that aren't you are just me. Because I feel like that's some serious dedication. <laughs> but we are seeing a, a pretty big point lead for Jocrates. I mean, to fake that number of people would would be pure insanity. There's no getting around it. But you've got to respect the effort. And much as predicted, it looks like round one is going to go in favor of Jocrates. I expect round two will be very similar. The... Just the, the ability of Tinkerel to fight at range compared to the ability of Terran to fight at range is, is pretty extreme. The, the Terran ability is, or the Terran advantage over Tinkerel is, is not its damage projection at range, it's, it's durability. And, uh, you can kind of see that here. The larger ships from Jocrates, basically, the shields can absorb four or five direct hits from an antimatter, which is a bit of a problem. More than that, and as you can see, one of the Jocrates ships losing its front half. More more guns than that, and they'll fall apart pretty quickly, but at that point, you're asking quite a bit. And they regenerate something like one antimatter's worth every second, so if you've only got one ship firing at one of Jocrates' big ships, it's functionally invincible. In the meantime, I don't think there's uh, I don't think there's really an amount of shield or tank that can subs sustain fire from Jocrates' damage projection.
Yeah, if Song Jang isn't Song Jang, then he's still the same guy that's been submitting as Song Jang since Song Jang started appearing in the NMSS tournaments. And that's about as far as I can validate. As it turns out, I do not have the, uh, the ability to do random background checks on everybody who sends me an email. For better or worse. And a very confident round two in favor of Jocrates. Iceborne's fleet is doing rather well, but I don't think it's... It's... Tinkerel ships are just too well suited to long range combat for a non-Tinkerel ship to really win. But next we have Iceborne up against Splinter. And Splinter's fleet is, in general, pretty slow compared to the Tinkerel submissions. But he's got these missiles, right? And these things are themselves pretty slow moving, but they fly for days. Which means that I think Splinter can probably project more long range DPS than Icemorn can. It's just a matter of getting the damn things to hit. And therein lies the game. But we can see Splinter's putting up some decent points on the board, however... Icemorn is taking the lead, but that's kind of what we saw before, was... Ralph giving up a bunch of points because the chief's sun is not the brightest. But, uh... Chester and Delta just doing work the whole time. However, the speed of Icemorn ships is a bit of a problem. I think what Splinter really needs are all the Ralphs to just die, so that things will actually move closer to the big ships and get missiles from every direction. And really, you wouldn't necessarily have to have alt accounts. Like, how many of these people have you ever seen post on the forums or in Discord or anything like that? All you really would need are extra email addresses. And, you know, color palette swaps. I don't know, I think Adventure Time's had a pretty good run. I'd rather a show end before it gets to the Dragon Ball Z stage where they've just run out of ideas and they're just kind of making everything up as they go at that point. I'd rather a show end while it's still good than go until it becomes bad. And very, there's still a Ralph alive somewhere apparently. Yeah, look at him. Look at him go. You can do it, Ralph. A pretty narrow point gap, but the round is starting to wind down. Could still very much go in either direction, but each one of Icemorn's ships is only worth a thousand. So, Splinter would need to kill a couple of them. To take the lead. And a lot of them have taken a big chunk of damage. And this is one of the things Spinner was talking about. Because he's relying so heavily on missiles 
kiting oriented fleets like this will probably be longer matches just because they end up running around the whole time Yeah, and that. <laughs> because the missiles last for so long, the longer matches mean that more missiles will be in space, and more objects is causes more time dilation. Oh man, Splinter just took a 600 point lead. Can he hold on to it for 15 seconds though? I'm feeling good about his odds, and the lead is slowly gaining. Looks like Spinner will be taking round one in the last 15 seconds. <laughs> and that sort of shit is why I don't skip rounds. Even if they do get a little dull sometimes. Skipping rounds is a... can cause some effects. But round one to Splinter. Let's uh, pull up a chair and watch round two. I do think it is still in Splinter's best interest for all the Ralphs to just die. They uh, are not helping a whole lot here. Maybe the Ralphs will come in different in a later, or in other sorts of engagements. Splinter pretty relentlessly tests everything, so it's entirely possible that the Ralphs come in very handy against a very specific build. Which we may or may not see, who knows. Is that a dead interceptor? Nope. It seems to have escaped. There's not enough volley left in that missile volley. And we could see a few little muzzle flashes off of Delta as it fired off some of those plasmas. But I don't know if there's going to be enough time for Splinter to catch up. Because his missiles are, uh, most of them are timing out rather than actually hitting targets, despite their lifespan, they, uh, 
most of his shots aren't really connecting and so he's not able to really do the damage he needs to and so wounded ships are getting away for the interceptors and then coming back and you know wounded ships don't award nearly as many points any point that they've given up they won't give up again Though that said, Splinter's only 200 points behind now, and by that I mean 200 points ahead. This sort of cluster thing is actually very good for Splinter. If they get very close like that, they can't maneuver nearly as well, and they're more likely to run into each other. And if that happens, then the ships from Iceborne are more likely to take hits as opposed to evading them successfully. So, you know, it's, it's very advantageous for Splinter to, or for, uh, for Splinter if Iceborne's ships end up becoming something of a cluster. But with now uh, about a 2,000 point lead and two seconds on the clock, looks like Splinter's taking round two. So no dreaded third round that everybody was worried about. Though there will be plenty more of Purgatory Squad fighting kiters. But now we have uh, SMW35 up against Husk. I feel like SMW35 might actually have the advantage here. Husk's little spinners are a good bit faster and might actually be able to put SMW35 ships up on the wall. But as we saw before, SW35 ships are very good at keeping range and applying damage. Uh, Kamikaze, we basically had all nuke tournaments at one point, and that's why nukes and troll ships are banned, because everything was just a troll ship with a nuke. And a whole bunch of unarmed ships that were just giant damage sponges. That was, uh, that was an old school tournament. Or, well, several old school tournaments all kind of had the same problem. These Sentinel ships from Husks, though, or Husk, though, are doing a very good job of absorbing damage in general. The, the Sentinel ships, as I mention it pretty often, but Sentinel armor is the most durable armor in the game. And on top of that, these things are spinning, so you can't really burrow through. You kind of have to kill all of it. And as a result, these spinners are rather durable. Even more so than other ships of their size. But, that said, the, uh, the Tinkerel ships, because of their range advantage will generally be able to score a lot of unanswered points. And so I think we're probably going to see point wins in favor of SMW35. Yeah, that was something I was looking at too. I don't know if you're doing it on purpose or not, but they are hollow in the middle, which is pretty neat. I think it has to do with how the glow eventually kind of wraps around or whatever it is. I'm not really sure how your shaders handle rendering, but the uh, the clear center effect does look pretty neat. And I don't know if that's something that the graphics overhauls did or that SNW did, or if it was even deliberate. It might have just happened. Right, right. Yeah, the uh, the way really expensive snot cannons look in the graphics overhaul is 
That's pretty great. But with the clock winding down and a pretty big point lead in favor of SNW, it could still technically turn around, but I don't think we're going to see anything too surprising in this round. And I think we're going to see very similar next round. The, the ships from Husk just can't close in with these kiters, and that's going to be a recurring problem in this, in this pool. This is a kiter-heavy pool. I was keeping up a bit better in the beginning, but I do think it's still going to change. I think we're probably going to see a lot like last round where SMW just ends up scoring a ton of unanswered points because longer range damage reduction and higher mobility. Uh, a little bit of recoil, but they've also done the drone launcher thing. So their ships are being forced to kite whether they want to or not. <laughs> Raid boss splinter. I think Purgatory Squad has a bit of a better chance against all the tank roll than most. They, uh, they're fairly mobile, but they're also fairly fragile and a bit more expensive, so taking them out of the field will change things pretty quickly. A lot of it hinges on whether or not the AI decides to do its job correctly, I think. But the crystalline missiles do stand a much better chance than most, in my opinion. Yeah, Splinter beat Ice Morn on points, but he did beat him. Uh, the second round, the point gap was a little bigger. The first round, it was, uh, you were actually behind until, like, the last, I think it was, like, the 17 second mark or whatever, where you took a point lead. And then he just held on to like a 500 point lead for the last few seconds. I think it'll be a little bit different against the tank roll though, because the tank roll project at range much more efficiently.
drinking. I'm thirsty. I'm also hungry if anybody wants to bring me something to eat. It'd be appreciated. And SNW 35 wins the match. So now we have SNW 35 against Jocrates. Here I think SNW 35 has a pretty big advantage overall. He's got more ships. He's got the the recoil escape. And yeah, you you can see it. Big tank girl ships are kind of a liability. Because they're it's so much invested in such a fragile chassis. In a tinkerel on tinkerel fight, the tinkerel with more ships generally wins. I don't want to eat Terrans for breakfast. I want eggs and bacon. It's a vastly superior breakfast than Terrans. Uh, yeah, here we can see it, it's probably going to go about the same as the previous round. Tinkerel's damage mitigation is not really their strong suit, so it doesn't take a bigger gun to kill Tinkerel more quickly, it just takes a gun. And so SNW 35 had more snipers, and so SNW 35 had a pretty colossal advantage. But now we have SNW 35 up against Splinter. Ye olde raid boss. And keeping up pretty well in points. Normally we were seeing Splinter fall behind early because the Ralphs would just get murdered by everything. But here against SNW 35, Splinter actually opened up out of the gate with a point advantage. If he can hold on to that, then he's looking golden. Although, of course, now uh, SW 35 has taken a bit of a point lead. I guess he's finally tagging all the Ralphs. And actually, one of the Ralphs just killed a ship. So, you know, that's a thing. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree. The missiles are pretty great. The, uh... Just watching the missile trails kind of weave toward a target. It seems like SNW-35 ships are having a very difficult time figuring out what to do with all these missiles coming toward them. It's making them very nervous. Which I can't really say I'd blame them. I'd be pretty nervous too. It's a lot of missiles. Does anybody know by chance if it's possible modifying factions or something like that where you can change how they behave with the colors? 
Because I think that would be neat. Being able to have more control over what colors your ships look like. Because with crystalline and factions like that, I guess Splinter pointed out, your one color pretty much decides everything. And so if you don't like the combination of colors, then deal with it. But I feel like... I feel like that's the kind of thing that wouldn't be baked into the engine. I feel like that's probably in factions.lua. But round one looks like it's going to go in favor of SW35. He's able to squeeze out about a 3,000 point lead with less than 10 seconds on the clock. So unless a ship or two goes down here in just a moment, looks like SW35 will be taking round one. Yeah, the color behavior. I don't know what else to really call it. Now in round two, the Ralph's having a bit of a harder time. You can see him uh, eating tinkle shots to the face pretty severely. A lot of, lot of long-range damage coming out of these tinkle ships. And it looks like we've got a pretty fair chance of a repeat of last round, with SW35 taking a pretty big point lead. I don't know if Splinter is going to be able to actually catch up and deal enough damage to make a comeback. He's got some work to do. Good morning, Jarpatis. But yeah. Splinter Suite's just having difficulty putting up any points at all in this kitey ass pool. Too much range coming out of those tinkle ships, and the missiles are just too slow. Well, I mean, how many Ralphs is the Chester? And Jocrates, your fleet's doing rather good. You've lost two SW35s in a tinkerel on tinkerel fight. But other than that, you are you've won all your matches so far. Yeah, there's still a thirty two ship limit, Splinter. I think what might have not been a terrible idea would have been to make Chester smaller and have three or four Chesters. I only have like two missile pods per Chester instead of five. 
But now he's got Husk up against Jocrates. And that's five wins for S and W35, so he'll be moving on. Ooh, the rammer is posing a bit of a problem for Jocrates ships. They're much less nimble than S and W35s. And it seems they uh off to a bit of a rough start, but Jocrates ships are also packing a ton of damage output. So if they get some time up on target on these big ships, they should be able to score some points back. Alright, Husk, have a good one. Husk has built up a pretty sizable lead though at this point. And since most of Husk's investment are in these big heavy ships, having a big lead is very difficult to come back from. Shooting that armor doesn't really award many points at all anymore. And it does look very promising for Husk. Who left for college just in time to miss this, I suppose. I still really like the green phosphorus was essentially several ships combined. If you got it to the right point of damage dealt, which was rare but could be done, it uh it had like an ejector seat that launched an entire separate ship. Yeah, the, this pool's running a bit longer than the other pools. We still have several matches to go. Yeah, those little rammers from Husk are being quite a bit of a problem for Jocrates fleet. They pretty regularly connect with the big tank rules.
Ah, you found the real song, Jang? You're gonna find out what his, uh, what his fleet name is supposed to be. Would the real Song Jang please stand up? Please stand up. Please stand up. Yeah, the Jaldar Escort seems to be having a bit of trouble with this. They're the projectile velocity, or the muzzle velocity, I guess, is too low to accurately hit the swarmers or something like that. And as a result, Jocrates has been spending the last minute just chasing the little rammers. He hasn't even begun working on the big guys yet. It is a bit problematic. And this is the flaw I was talking about that I encounter pretty often. Putting a drone launcher on the Tinkrel ship causes it to stay at range all the time, but sometimes they just sit there not shooting for extended periods of time like this. This ship could absolutely move forward a little bit and shoot, but it, but it isn't. Yes, yeah, that's the name that's on his, on the emails he sends. It's like li 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 li. So, Jocrates did manage to pull uh, a rather nice point lead here in round two, though might be able to hold it, but it looks like some of his ship, like he's got the one ship that looks like it might be getting pinched here in a second. Or maybe it'll escape. Who knows? Tinkerl AI is pretty erratic at times. But Jocrates is building up a very big point lead. Looks like we're going to round three. Much to the delight of Kamikaze Dalek. Basically similar to what has often been happening, some of the rammers from Husk managed to collide with the larger snipers from Jocrates. And if ever there was a faction that fared poorly under ramming, I think Tinkerl is up there. I think really only Reds 
are worse at dealing with getting rammed than Tinkrel. And that's mostly just because the reds are allergic to damage in general. Okay, so Song Jang's lead name is Face Rolling the Keyboard. Got it. I'm not familiar with Starfish. I'll have to take a look at it. Why would it not be allowed in the tournament? Does it do something unusual? And Jockery's building up a pretty hefty point lead. In round three, he's got a minute on the clock, so it's plenty of time for the Tinkerel AI to do what it loves doing. But it does look promising in Jocrates' favor. Uh, no, if it has multi-cores, it's not allowed. Unless the tournament rules otherwise specify. And I know the, the tournament description can get a little wordy, but basically, if I have sufficient patience, I should be able to build your ship in the campaign mode in a vanilla game with only the blocks that would normally show up on the upgrade screen. And since command cores don't show up on that screen, then, uh, what is it? Since command cores don't show up on the screen, multi-core ships are not allowed. And so in that way it kind of is covered. Does that make sense? Since the command core is not an unlockable part, it's not something you can build with your ship. You just start with one. You can't add additional. And Jocrates takes the match. So next up, we have Husk up against the raid boss. Let's see how these two go. Now this is going to be probably the only... Or no, I guess Song Jang's fleet was a slugging match too, but... The first slugging match we've seen in a while. Yeah, no problem, Jocrates. Um, be lucky I actually caught it with you. Uh, this is his name. Toxico Waste Incendio. Uh, I didn't notice that he had done the same thing, except I couldn't double his fleet because it was above the 16 ship count. So doubling it would have put it above 32. But, uh, so Toxico ended up competing with a 16k fleet and a 32k tourney did not go over well for him right kamikaze if you press if you go into a red campaign game and you press U can you unlock the campaign core or the the command core that's the thing if you can't drag it off the part palette onto your ship then I don't want to see it on the ship. That's why there's no farmer super thrusters, that's why there's no asteroid blocks for Terrans. That sort of thing. But yeah, the... 
That said though, the Sentinels, as I mentioned before, I consider the Sentinels to be the apex tier brawling faction, and now we're kind of seeing why. Even though the Chesters aren't really brawlers, but the Delta itself is even struggling against one of these uh, disc shape ships. Taking some good chunks of damage off of the outer layers, but starting to lose its own outer layers in the process. It's going to be a big problem for Delta here very soon. And it looks like round one is going to go in favor of Husk. finally see a Chester go down. I think that's the first time a Chester has died yet. I think. I want to say SNW35 didn't kill them. I think he just won on points, but I don't remember. Yeah, I'm feeling like this is going to be one of those pools where I'll have to load up the the pool stats and take a look at them to see who's actually advancing. I know SNW35 got five wins, but I don't know if anyone else is going to walk away with four. I think we're probably going to have a tie at three. Yeah, this sort of design here, Tank Husko has been working on for a little while now. And I feel like it's been a mixed bag of success, but uh, they seem to be holding up pretty well here. They're just not fast enough to catch up to kiters, and as we've seen with certain kinds of kiters, that can be a real problem. Might be about to see one of the big ones go, but I think it's too little too late. Yeah, there's only two seconds left on the clock. Husk takes round one. So let's uh, see how he holds up in round two.
Every ship has to look like a tank, and every ship is only allowed one big gun and one small one. Yeah, and it looks like Husk is doing basically the same thing this round as what happened last round. They're gradually building up a points difference. I think the ships from Husk are just too durable for Splinter's Fleet to really get any purchase on. I mean, Delta is probably the bulk of the fleet DPS. You can see it's struggling to tear apart the outer layers. I think it might kill this big guy left to its own devices, though, if nothing changes anytime too soon. Yeah, you know, like as long as no ships come slowly driving over. And then, you know, causing Delta to switch focus from one ship to another. As long as that doesn't happen. Valiant effort by Splinter's Fleet, but I think Sentinels are just too brawly. And the reliance on missiles, which are a solid source of damage, but not. They're not competitive on the same scale that the plasma condensers are. I think that's costing quite a bit. This is the one that was all shot up before. Look at it repairing itself now. This is a sad day for Delta. And this Chester over here doing actually exactly what Chester should be doing, I think. Uh, Chester's already dead. Delta just died.
And with just a few seconds left on the clock, looks like Husk will be taking the match. And last up, we have Jocrates up against Splinter. I didn't really get to look at the score screen as much as I'd have liked there. But we'll see how it goes. The the fleet from Jocrates probably would be better at punching through all this heavy armor, but at the same time the ships are less mobile. And so he's gonna have a more difficult time avoiding all of these missiles. SNW thirty five got away with it largely because he was able to move so fast all the time. And the missiles just couldn't keep up and so all of them were timing out. I think once it comes time for Jocrates to actually fight the Chesters and Delta, I think he's going to struggle a bit more. Although he's also, I think, going to spend more time trying to kill the Ralphs. He, Jocrates' fleet seems to be slower when it comes to killing swarm ships than SNW-35's was. I mean, a combat and beauty tournament would be nice, but, like, aside from assigning arbitrary point values and then, like, crowdsourcing the information, I don't know how to figure out which ship is the prettiest. Because I have my preferences, but my preferences aren't necessarily the same as everybody else's. And so the, the combat is easy enough. But figuring out how to assign points based on beauty is a whole other matter. Yeah, the pole system is what I meant by crowdsourcing. Just basically throwing up a, uh, a straw poll and figuring out who the viewers like the most. But then if there's only like two or three viewers, you know, some streams we have, I think at one point on this stream we had 12, now we have 7 including me. The the number of viewers on the reassembly streams is pretty erratic. I'd have to do a poll system, I guess, for through like Discord and uh the forums and all that. And then just do the combat on stream, I guess, maybe. But then the combat still gets a little wonky too, because uh, if we do the sub pool format, I'd have to do like a double elimination or something, where you can just throw everybody in one group and let them fight as much as possible. Running a, a say we get 18 submissions, a pool of 18 would be here for like 16 or 17 hours. And sub pools aren't that great either. Spinner with a very slight po point lead though, here with less than 10 seconds on the clock. Jocrates was off to a pretty strong start, but I think the ships are having a difficult time avoiding all the missiles. And it's costing Jocrates a lot of points as a result, and giving round one to Splinter.
Uh, yeah, I think the category tournament might be the longest. I haven't really looked. But that was largely just because the category tournament was like four different little tournaments. I think that one I did everything offline and just did it whenever I could get around to the, the actual matches. I don't think I actually even tried to stream that one because it would have been too long. Yeah, the the trappers were pretty time dilating. And I think, yeah, didn't Duke have his bullets with all the lasers on him? Yeah. So those things were, uh... Those things were time dilating too. And spun her off to a little bit of a point lead a lot earlier than the last time. We'll see if he can hold on to it. It's a very narrow point gap, but because of the nature of Tinkerel ships, it could shift very quickly. Yeah, the category one was the one I broke everything into roughly half hour videos. I'm still not entirely sure if that was a good idea or not. Nobody really said anything one way or the other. And still holding on to a lead and actually kind of increasing it a little bit. Looks like Splinter might be taking round two. And if that happens, I'm pretty sure we're going to have a tie at three wins. I mean, you might have. I might have streamed it on multiple days. I don't remember. It, it was more than a week ago. My memory is murky at best. Only a 500 point lead with less than 15 seconds on the clock. What Splinter really needs is to catch one of these Tinkrel snipers with the volley of missiles and just, you know, put it out of its misery. I believe the antimatters beat Husk. And Splinter wins the match, so yep, yeah, we've got a tie at three, so I'll need to take a closer look at that and figure out who's advancing. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed.